Hi, and welcome to Lecture 7, which is titled Optical Fiber Cabling Systems. In this lecture, we'll review TIA standards-based design options and installation guidelines for optical fiber cabling systems. Let's begin with a look at the centralized fiber design option. The centralized fiber design layout takes advantage of the extended link length capabilities of optical fiber cabling to eliminate the need for network equipment between the distributor room serving the building and every user work area, as shown here. In this design, the network devices serving all work areas in the building are grouped and centrally located in the building's distributor room, shown here on the ground floor. The distributor rooms or distributor enclosures on each floor are then used to splice or connectorize the fibers in the backbone cables to the two fiber or four fiber horizontal cables routed to the individual work area equipment outlets on the floor. An alternate centralized fiber design suitable for smaller buildings uses continuous lengths of two fiber or four fiber cables to directly link each work area equipment outlet to the building's distributor room, as shown here. In this design, the distributor room or enclosure is used simply as a pull-through and slack cable storage space, with each cable entering and exiting the DR or DE without any splicing or connectorization. Next, we'll take a closer look at a network architecture based on centralized fiber cabling, called Passive Optical Local Area Network, or POLAN. A POLAN is characterized as a point-to-multipoint network, used in place of the more familiar point-to-point -point network layout, where one switch port connects to one end device, such as a desktop phone, a wireless access point, or a laptop computer. Unlike most network connections that use a four-pair balanced twisted-pair copper cable, or a two-strand multi-mode fiber cable, a POLAN connection operates over a single strand of single-mode fiber. The point-to-multipoint architecture is enabled through passive optical splitters that split or combine wavelengths so that one single-mode fiber strand from a building's distributor room branches out to multiple work area devices. A common split ratio is 1 to 32. The active or powered POLAN equipment consists of an optical line terminal or OLT, shown here on the left, communicating with many optical network terminals or ONTs distributed throughout the building or campus using single mode fiber. And since most work area devices require copper or RJ45 connectivity, each ONT also functions as a media converter typically equipped with two or more RJ45 ports, as shown on the right. The advantages of using a POLAN architecture include cost savings through reduced energy consumption and less network maintenance due to the centralized architecture. Other advantages include significant space savings, since network equipment is no longer required on every floor. All switches and servers are centralized in one building or campus distributor room that also houses the OLT. The extended reach of single-mode fiber makes it possible to provide network services from a single distributor room to every device on a multi-building campus, over links that can be as long as 20 kilometers. As well, this centralized grouping of network devices is inherently easier to physically secure than a collection of rooms on various floors, especially when dealing with high-rise buildings or multi-building campuses. POLAN architecture can be used to deliver network services in dedicated facilities, such as hotels, university campuses, hospitals, sports stadiums, and conference centers, in addition to commercial or office buildings. The common element is a large space with many network devices spread out over extended distances. These types of facilities are best suited to take advantage of single-mode fiber's reach and bandwidth capabilities. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the standard local area network and passive optical local area network architectures. 
A typical campus-based local area network uses a hierarchical arrangement of network switches in multiple distributor rooms, usually interconnected with backbone multimode fiber, with horizontal copper cabling extending to user work areas, as shown on the left here. By contrast, the campus-based passive optical local area network, shown on the right, directs all traffic using single-mode fiber over links as long as 20 kilometers, with a centralized optical line terminal in a single campus distributor room at one end, connecting directly to each of the optical network terminals serving one or more work areas. In addition to reducing the quantity of cables and associated pathway requirements, the POLAN architecture also eliminates the need to provision and manage intermediate switches in various building distributors and floor distributors throughout the campus. Next, we'll take a closer look at another implementation of centralized fiber cabling that is used to deliver both electrical power and network connectivity over extended distances using a single composite cable containing both fiber strands and copper conductors. The term powered fiber cabling is used to describe a link that delivers both electrical power and network signaling to a power over Ethernet extender device that can be installed beyond the 100 meter channel limit for copper cabling, up to 3 kilometers, depending on the amount of power required by the end device. Examples include indoor or outdoor surveillance cameras, Wi Fi access points, emergency phone stations, or POLAN optical network terminals to be placed in locations where no electrical outlet is readily available to power the device to be installed. In cases where there are a limited number of network devices to connect beyond the 100 meter limit, it's not practical or cost effective to plan for additional distributor rooms or distributor enclosures on one or more floors in a building. Instead, the designer can use powered fiber cabling links to connect those devices to the network, as shown here. Next, we'll review the standards-based distance limits for optical fiber cabling channels, which vary by both network type as well as by type of fiber used. Unlike twisted pair copper cabling systems with their well-established 100 meter maximum channel length, the network spans for optical fiber vary by type of network, type of fiber, and even by the wavelength used over a given type of fiber. The designer must therefore match the capabilities of the proposed fiber links to the requirements for current and future network implementations. Here we summarize the standards-based end-to-end maximum allowable channel length and end-to-end -end attenuation or loss values for multimode fiber at the 850 nanometer wavelength for 1 gigabit, 10 gigabit, 25 gigabit, 40 gigabit, 50 gigabit, and 100 gigabit Ethernet. Note that the 1, 10, and 40 gigabit Ethernet specifications all predate the introduction of the OM5 fiber grade, and in the case of 1 gigabit Ethernet, Additional testing was performed later to identify its OM3 and OM4 limits. As shown here, the allowable losses are expanded into two categories, attenuation as the signal travels over the length of the cable and attenuation caused by the signal passing through connectors or splices in the end-to-end -end channel. As the data rates increase, both the maximum allowable channel length and attenuation values are reduced with the OM4 and OM5 fiber types providing a longer reach than OM3. Also note that the maximum channel lengths decrease significantly above 10 gigabits per second, with no more than 70 meters allowed in some cases. This limited reach makes it necessary to consider single mode fiber when designing network links for larger buildings or multi-building campuses. And here are the equivalent channel length and loss limits for single mode fiber using transceivers that operate at the lower single mode wavelength of 1310 nanometers. As shown here, using single mode fiber instead of multi mode extends a network channel from meters to kilometers. 
but there's a higher price to pay for the single mode optical transceivers necessary for the network devices at both ends of the channel. Note that there are also published standards for single mode links longer than 10 kilometers, but our focus here is on building and campus connectivity. Next, we'll summarize several additional options for a designer to consider when planning an optical fiber cabling system, starting with cable type. There are three considerations when selecting the optical fiber cable for a link. The type or types of fiber the cable will contain, the number of strands required for both current and future needs, and the physical construction of the cable itself to suit the environment where it will be placed. Here's a quick overview of the types of cables available and the standards-based color code for both the cables and the fiber strands within the cables. The first type of cable construction is loose tube, where 250 micron fiber strands are placed in buffer tubes within the cable, usually in groups of 12. This construction is routinely selected for aerial or underground outdoor or campus cables, with gel or tape used to prevent moisture infiltration. If necessary, additional physical protection can be provided by a layer of corrugated steel armor between two layers of jacketing. It's also possible to select loose tube construction for indoor use when the intent is to field connectorize the fiber strands using multi-fiber or MPO connectors, as shown here. The second type of cable construction is tight buffer where the 250 micron fiber strands are individually buffered or tightly covered with a protective layer, making their external diameter 900 microns, or just under 1 millimeter, which is equal to 1000 microns. This construction is widely used for indoor cables, as well as for fire-rated outdoor or campus cables, which can be extended and routed within buildings after entry without the need to transition to a fire-rated cable in the entrance room or entrance space. As with loose tube cables, additional physical protection for both indoor and outdoor tight buffer cables can be provided by a layer of corrugated steel armor between two layers of jacketing. Armored indoor cables are ideal for use in shared cable trays, where they may end up beneath other heavy cable bundles. In such cases, the armoring prevents excessive signal loss due to the higher crushing forces along the length of the fiber cables. Note that most manufacturers also offer hybrid constructions, containing both single-mode and multi-mode fibers. The third type of cable construction is ribbon, where the fiber strands are attached to each other in a row creating a flat or pliable strip of fibers suitable for multi-fiber mass fusion splicing, as shown here. The ribbon construction is typically selected for high fiber counts, all the way up to 6,912 strands in a single cable. Note that the highest densities numbering in the thousands are typically associated with data center and service provider facilities. The fourth type of cable construction is pre-terminated, where the fiber cable is cut to the desired length and connectorized at one or both ends at the factory by the manufacturer, essentially the equivalent of a long fiber pigtail or patch cord. After the cable is installed, the connectorized ends are inserted into adapters mounted on fiber patch panels or cassettes at one or both ends, which eliminates all connectorization time and minimizes termination errors. Note that pre-terminated or pre-term cabling was initially developed as a solution for data center computer rooms, but it can also be used in commercial building distributor rooms or any other environment where the required cable lengths can be accurately measured. Next, we'll summarize the color codes for both fiber cables and individual fiber strands. The jacket color of an indoor fiber cable identifies the type of fiber in the cable as follows. An orange colored fiber cable indicates that the cable contains older OM1 or OM2 multimode fibers, 
both of which are no longer recommended for current gigabit rate networks. Cables containing OM3 grade fibers have aqua colored jackets. When OM4 cables were introduced, no new color was assigned in standards publications for the cable jacket, so aqua continued to be used, making it necessary to read the printing on the jacket to establish whether it was OM3 or OM4. Multiple manufacturers decided to introduce a new color, violet, to prevent confusion in spaces that used both OM3 and the new OM4 cables, so it remains the designer or buyer's responsibility to specify the jacket color when ordering OM4 cable. And the latest addition to the multimode cable family is OM5, which can easily be identified by its lime green color, as specified in Addendum 2 to the TIA-598-D Fiber Color Code Standard, published in 2018. Single mode cable color is less complicated. Standards specify yellow for all indoor single mode cable jackets. Note that cables constructed for outdoor placement are usually black to limit deterioration caused by the sun's ultraviolet or UV rays. The color code used to identify and sequence individual fiber strands is an extension of the color code used for balanced twisted pair copper cabling. The first five pairs, or ten fibers, use the same colors as their copper counterparts, but an additional two colors, rose and aqua, were initially required because fiber cables contained strand counts in multiples of 12, such as 24 fiber and 48 fiber, versus 100 pair and 300 pair copper cables. And the same colors are used for subunits within a cable. For example, a 96 fiber loose tube cable may contain 8 buffer tubes, each containing 12 fiber strands. Tube number 1 would be blue, tube number 2 would be orange, and so on. So the same color code identifies both the sequence of the fibers and the sequence of the tubes containing the fibers. More recently, the fiber base count has been extended from 12 to 16 to enable very high-speed networks such as 400 and 800 gigabit Ethernet. In response, the TIA has published Addendum 1 to the 598-D Fiber Color Code Standard, listing four additional colors for strands 13 through 16, olive, magenta, tan, and lime. Next, we'll summarize the two-fiber duplex and multi-fiber parallel connector options for a designer to consider when planning an optical fiber cabling system. Duplex fiber connectors terminate two fiber strands, and currently the most widely used duplex connector is the LC, with a density of 72 duplex LC ports, or 144 connectorized fiber strands, capable of fitting a patch panel one rack unit or RU in height. However, the continuous growth in network performance requires more fibers in the same amount of space on both patch panels and optical transceivers as shown here, which means we need connectors with greater density than the LC. Three new duplex connectors have been introduced as the next generation. They're referred to as very small form factor or VSFF connectors to differentiate them from the small form factor LC. The CS connector takes up approximately half the space of the LC duplex, making it possible to insert two duplex CS connectors or four fiber strands into a patch panel adapter or optical transceiver that is the same size as a two fiber strand LC duplex transceiver as shown here. The SN and MDC connectors are even smaller, taking up approximately one quarter of the space needed by the LC duplex, making it possible to insert four duplex SN or MDC connectors or eight fiber strands into a patch panel adapter or optical transceiver that is the same size as an LC duplex transceiver, as shown here. 
the MPO parallel fiber connector terminates multiple fiber strands, most often 8 or 12, with 16, 24 or 32 also available, as shown here. As with duplex connectors, the continuous growth in network performance requires more fibers in the same amount of space on both patch panels and optical transceivers, which means we need parallel connectors with greater density than the MPO. The 16 fiber SNMT and MMC are examples of the next generation of parallel connectors, taking up approximately one quarter of the space needed by the MPO, making it possible to insert four SNMT or MMC connectors or 64 fibers into a patch panel adapter or optical transceiver that is the same size as an MPO adapter or transceiver, as shown here. Here's an example of connector migration from LC duplex connectors and transceivers to MPOs. The existing setup, as shown here, uses two 12-strand backbone optical fiber cables to link network switches in two distributor rooms. MPO connectors at the ends of the backbone cables are inserted into pre-connectorized cassettes. Each cassette internally connects the two 12-fiber MPO connectors in the back to 12 LC duplex connectors in the front. And LC duplex cords are used to link the cabling to the optical fiber transceivers in the switches at both ends. When new switches with 12-fiber MPO-based transceivers are acquired, there's no need to disturb the backbone cables. The cassettes are removed from the patch panels and are replaced with MPO frames. The backbone cables are then plugged into the MPO adapters on the frames. And 12-fiber MPO cords replace the LC duplex cords, connecting each 12-fiber cable to an MPO transceiver at each end of the link. Note that it's up to the designer to initially select the right quantity and types of fibers, cables and connectors in order to make any future migration as simple and cost-effective as possible. Next, we move to the final topic in this lecture which is a review of installation guidelines or reminders for optical fiber cabling. The way a fiber cable is constructed greatly impacts its handling requirements. Standards-based recommendations make a distinction between smaller cables containing up to four fiber strands, larger cables containing more than four fiber strands, and fiber patch cords. It must be emphasized that in all cases, it's the cable manufacturers that have the final say in how their products must be handled during and after installation. As shown in this example, manufacturers provide detailed specifications for bending limits and allowable temperature ranges during storage, installation and operation. Here's a summary of TIA standards recommendations for optical fiber cabling installation. The pulling tension on a single 2-fiber or 4-fiber indoor cable must not exceed 220 newtons or 50 pound force. If multiple cables are pulled together, the tension must be evenly distributed to prevent excessive tension on any single cable. If the cable contains more than 4-fiber strands, the standards refer the reader to the cabling manufacturer for guidelines. For indoor-outdoor campus cables containing up to 12 fiber strands, the pulling tension must not exceed 1335 newtons or 300 pound force. This value is doubled for cables containing more than 12 fibers. The standards recommended limit for bending two fiber or four fiber cables during installation is no less than a 50 millimeter bend radius. For all other cable types, it's no less than 20 times the outside diameter of the cable. And after the cable has been installed, these minimum bend radius values are reduced by half. They also apply to all fiber patch cords, which are typically handled and moved more frequently than any cable. 
Note that these are all general recommendations published in cabling standards. Any vendor can expand or reduce these limits for the cables or cords they manufacture. When inspecting or auditing a fiber cabling installation, emphasis is usually placed on the termination of the cables at both ends, due to the greater exposure of the fiber strands. Items to verify for both cables and cords include bend radius control, controlled management of excess length or slack, adequate strain relief at the connector, sufficient connector mechanical resistance to prevent easy disconnection, and labeling that clearly identifies each link. And no discussion on optical fiber cabling installation can be considered complete without covering detailed inspection and cleaning, also referred to as fiber hygiene. A lot of fiber infrastructure troubleshooting can be avoided by keeping contaminants away from connector end faces in mating adapters and transceiver ports. Detailed inspection consists of a close-up look at the fiber strands housed within connectors. Two levels of magnification are required when inspecting connector end faces, which should always take place prior to any connectorization into mating adapters and transceiver ports. The lower level, or 200 times magnification, allows for the inspection of the entire connector end face. The higher level, or 400 times magnification, zooms in on the fiber core, where all optical signals are transported. If contaminants are discovered during inspection, specialized solvents, wipes, swabs, and cleaning systems are available for removing them. Connector end faces can be cleaned directly or through the housings of mating adapters and transceiver ports, as shown here. Sources of connector end face contamination include airborne particles, particularly outdoors and in harsh environments. Other contaminants come in the form of oil and other residue transferred when handling connections, from lubricants used for pulling cable, and from using too much solvent to clean a connector. Inspection and cleaning should be a routine task for any installer or technician working with fiber connectors. It should not be assumed that a sealed shipment bag contains clean connector end faces. If a connector is removed from a mating adapter or transceiver port, it must be inspected before it's plugged into the same or another adapter or port. It's also essential to inspect after cleaning and prior to connectorization in order to confirm that all contamination has been removed and there's no residue remaining from the cleaning process. This brings us to the end of Lecture 7, titled Optical Fiber Cabling Systems. Thank you for watching.